Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Stephen Rostin from Ceres. We're going to give people just a literally a few more seconds, and then we're going to get started. But we appreciate your your joining us today. Um, again, there are people joining, so we we'll give people just a few more seconds, and then we will kick this off. But uh, thank you for joining this webinar. We have several really distinguished speakers to talk about how insurers are rising to the challenge of climate risk disclosure. My name is Stephen Rothstein, and I'm the managing director of the Series Accelerator for Sustainable Capital Markets. Um, thank you again. You know, many of you have worked with Series, but briefly, we're a sustainability nonprofit working uh, with influential investors and companies from around the world on a host of global sustainability challenges from water risk and climate and deforestation. And then the Accelerator team works on our financial markets. Um, we are unfortunately all seeing the effects of climate change in extreme weather throughout the US and the world. We don't have to go further than literally opening the paper any day, whether it be the floods, the fires, the, 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 the weather, it's just, it, it's heartbreaking. There are devastating effects on people and communities. And we really appreciate the leadership from insurers and their regulators in this effort. Last year, Ceres released a major report on banks, and we noted that, quote, the banking industry's current lending and disclosure practices are leaving them, and, in, and really all of us, in dangerously vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Well, insurers are among the largest investors in the world, and obviously similarly concerned about investors and in, in investments in high emissions areas. To address this, the first step to managing a problem is measuring it, to know what the problems are. To manage these risks, disclosure is, is essential. And Ceres applauds and welcomes the investments that insurers are making, including our speakers today, uh, to rise to this challenge. Our session is focused on one element of this complicated issue, and that's on the TCFD reporting in the United States. We're also seeing this in formal recommendations to the Securities and Exchange Commission. What we've done is we've analyzed all the investor comments that were submitted recently to the SEC. And there is overwhelming support for TCFD. There's overwhelming support for GHG admissions, a lot of support for scopes one, two, and three, not three is more complicated. We can talk about that. It's an important signal. So before I introduce the really important and distinguished panel maker members, excuse me, we have two uh, leaders in this field, two commissioners, um, and we're going to first go to the California Insurance Commissioner, Ricardo Lara, that he, with the Washington Insurance Commissioner, we'll hear from in a minute, they and their colleagues have been leading this at NAIC. So Commissioner Lara, thank you for all that you're doing, and we'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. It's great to be here. I'm excited to, to welcome all, all of you to the virtual, uh, virtually to the series webinar on climate risk disclosure and specifically a discussion around uh, TCFD guidelines. You know, climate risk disclosure is, as you pointed out, an important piece of California's vision for how to approach and reduce future climate risks. Last July, I'm proud to say we launched an executive level task force at the National Association of Insurance Commissioners and set up specific work streams to really address what we thought were some of the most important and poignant topics. Of course, climate risk disclosure, innovation, technology, uh, solvency, and pre-disaster mitigation. Uh, 33 states and jurisdictions have joined our task force and our climate risk disclosure work stream has been meeting uh, to review our current climate risk disclosure survey, and we will be making recommendations on how to move forward in the coming months. I appreciate the, the leadership of Commissioner Stolfi of Oregon and the many states that are really working on this unique effort. I'm proud to say that uh, nine states this year joined the climate risk disclosure survey, uh, including two states with Republican governors and we have built a broader bipartisan coalition that now encompasses 78% of the entire uh, insurance market, a tremendous accomplishment. The new jurisdictions include Delaware, Washington, DC, 
Vermont, Maryland, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Maine, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. In June, uh, Commissioner Kreidler and I also sent a letter to our licensed insurers requesting that they submit what we call um, TCFD reports aligning with the recommendations of the task force on climate related financial disclosures. Over the last five years, TCFD has emerged as the leading international standard for climate reporting for all industries, including insurance. These reporting, this reporting framework, I should say, has been endorsed by over 1500 organizations, including financial firms managing over 130 trillion in assets. Uh, the United Kingdom, as we know, France, New Zealand, and Hong Kong have all publicly stated that they are implementing TCFD reporting. Uh, in June, as many as you know, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission chair issued the re a request for comment on climate reporting and TCFD figures heavily in the discussion of the SEC. Uh, more comprehensive disclosures will inform, I believe, regulators and, and how companies prepare. Uh, and of course, we'll also help, um, you know, the public will continue to have accessible climate risk information, which in many cases they do not have currently. I appreciate again, Ceres for hosting the webinar today to discuss these TCFD reports. This information will assist companies as they consider submitting not only their reports, but also adopting um, the TCFD reporting as part of a series recommendations in their 2020 report, where they called for addressing climate as systematic risks for financial markets. And with that, you know, the broader economy. Uh, again, I just wanna thank, thank you to all the panelists uh, from Zurich and AIG for sharing your experiences today. And of course, to my great friend, Butch Bakani, who has been such an important partner in California, working on various fronts with us. Um, and of course, a, a, a lot of jurisdictions around the world. Today's series is again, providing a helpful step towards a more consistent and effective reporting standard, really integrating these TCFD guidelines into business practices and regulatory practices is gonna be a key piece of our puzzle. I, I strongly believe that you know the better and more consistent we disclose climate risk, the more potential for sustainable policy making uh, will occur, and this will help us all prepare for a future for future climate risk impacts. Uh, again, thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts, and I'm proud that California uh, is one of the states that continues to lead in these efforts, and we will do, uh, we will continue to do so. Uh, so again, thank you, Steve, for your invitation, and uh, look forward to seeing you hopefully all soon and uh, in person one day. I hope to see you in person, absolutely. I also want to recognize, people won't be able to read it in detail, but your new report, um, Protecting uh, Communities, Preserving Nature and Building Resiliency is a must read for everybody. Uh, I keep mine under my pillow. Um, <laughs> and in, car there's a, there's a, in all seriousness, there is uh, uh, lots of great results in there. And I know Butch was involved and other people. So, you know, it's another step that you're doing. So appreciate the first that. First of its kind. Yes, exactly. So really appreciate that. You also, Commissioner, I mean, you know this, but your team, Mike Peterson and others, they're such leaders in this area. So, so thanks for that. We have a great team. So uh, we'll continue to push the envelope and make sure we make this, uh, these TCFD uh, reporting guidelines uh, uh, requirement for everybody. So we're, we're looking forward to doing the work. Thanks, Commissioner. We're going to go on to now Commissioner Kreidler. But before we do that, just a few quick things I should have said earlier. A, this is being recorded, just so you're all aware. Uh, second thing is that, there, that we do very much want your questions. So in the bottom of, and you, again, you've all been on these calls for, for months and months now, in the Q&A section, please put in your questions. Um, and if we have your email because you registered, great. But if we don't include it, because if we don't get to the questions during this, we will follow up with everybody in writing. We also are gonna share these slides later. So there'll be a few slides that go very quickly, but you'll get them later on. So with that, let's hear greetings from another leader, the uh, Michael uh, uh, Kreidler from Washington. Hello, I'm Mike Kreidler, Washington State Insurance Commissioner, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this webinar. 
on how to produce a meaningful TCFD report. Insurers play a big role in helping us to arrive in time uh, to a net zero world. Uh, your investment and underwriting uh, decisions are key to helping us uh, get to that on that pathway. In addition, you uh, have a responsibility to disclose to your investors and consumers, uh, customers, uh, employers, and, and regulators uh, how you are uh, managing all of the material risk that you have for your business. And that would include climate change. Uh, many U.S. insurers have been required since 2009. Uh, in fact, I'd say most uh, U.S. insurers have been required since 2009 to report to the NEIC annually on their climate change effect uh, on your business with the climate risk disclosure survey. Uh, for these companies, it should not be a major effort to transition to TCFD reporting. There is substantial overlap between the survey questions that uh, we had uh, at, as to those that are pillars of the TCFD. Commissioner Lara and I have been encouraging companies to report to us uh, and submit their TCFD report in lieu of answering our questions from the questionnaire. I want to particularly thank Ceres for pre presenting this opportunity here to describe just exactly what can and how it should be done. They've done laudable work in helping us to identify how we can improve this reporting. Uh, later, you're going to have an opportunity to hear from a company that's already making these kind of filings, a couple of companies, one of them being AIG and the other one being Zurich. As we go forward, they're, they're taking the first steps and they're going to be the ones that will be able to help show real life what's happening. Thank you so much. Commissioner, thank you. Again, you and your team, Jay, and everyone on your team have been leaders in this for years, and the country is better off because of that. So we appreciate that. Um, I, I, I'm going to identify the three panel members, just give a quick, and then show a few slides before they, before they speak. Um, but uh, we're really distinguished. So Butch Bakani, as this says, the program leader, the United Nations, the principles for sustainable insurance initiatives. There is not an area around the world in insurance sustainability issues that Butch isn't at the center of, and we appreciate that. Then we have two leaders that have been working at this hard for several years at, at major companies, Ben Harper, the Director of Corporate Sustainability at Zurich North America, and Jennifer Walden Grant, the Chief Sustainability Officer in AIG. Um, again, when you get this slide, you can click on their name for their, their background and more information about that, but won't, won't share that now. Next slide, please. Um, as I said earlier, in terms of series, I won't spend a lot of time on that now, working on, on a variety of areas. Next slide, please. And then within series, uh, the group that's focused in particular is the series accelerator. Next slide, please. Commissioner Lara already talked about this, so I'm gonna go through these very quickly, but I give the several commissioners and the NAIC enormous credit for the work they've been doing in this for years. Um, the, the, the six states initially, um, and that they're all available, they're all public. This is really a model for other industries to follow, other sectors to follow. Next slide, please. And then as the commissioner just said, these nine additional states and territories that just joined. So that's 78% of the market that will be asked to, to make sure they submit climate risk disclosures with strong encouragement for TCFD. So next slide, please. So Ceres took a look at uh, the companies that have already filed TCFD. And there are these eight companies here. Um, and there are 59 elements within, or elements or sub-elements, if you look at all the questions that TCF, uh, uh, the TCFD asks. And some of the companies had a lot of them completed. Some, it's a first uh, year, and there's, it's because of a, very much of a work in progress. Next slide, please. That um, those that filed, are the, again, the seven insurance companies and the one reinsurance. 
and we appreciate their effort to do that. This is AIG's second. This is just in the US. Obviously, there's a lot of others around the world, and Butch will talk more about that. Um, and there's both US-based companies and international-based companies that are operating in the US that have filed these. Next slide, please. We're, um, these are big step forwards, um, and we appreciate that. And it's also, as I say, a work in progress that some were more specific on climate scenarios and time horizons. And you know that's as they as a filed in year after year, continue to look at these. Um, that all of them covered scope one and scope two of the business operations. Some covered scope three of the business operations. None included scope three of their clients. We hope that's an area as this continues to evolve that each of the companies look at going forward. Next slide, please. I'm gonna give just a few examples. And again, you'll, you'll get these slides. Uh, so we're not gonna go through the details now, but these are some best practices examples from some of the companies. And they're all highlighted as best practices because they give more of a guidance, more of a viewpoint of, of those areas. So this is one on the governance side that uh, is just, it, it gives more nuance about how governance works. I'm not saying this is exactly the right answer, but this is uh, just a good example. N next slide, please. These next few, and again, this gives a, a, a context from Allianz in terms of strategy, looking at a 1.5 degree and a two degree. And it's just, it's a very nuanced and thoughtful way to look at this area. Um, I didn't highlight, we didn't highlight uh, examples from our great speakers, because they're going to talk about their own reports to so be presumptuous, but they have many great things in those as well. Next slide, please. Um, another example of strategy that we encourage people to think about is different timeframes. So this one looks at, a, again, one to three year, three to five, and five to 50. As you all know, all of these are public um, through the great service of the, of the California office. So you can take a look as your, at, at your own um, think as you're doing your own filing. Next slide, please. And the last one, this is, again, you can see uh, over time, looking starting from 2011, 17, 18, and 19, as they're looking at metrics and targets and giving more indication. So the, 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 it gives more indication of what they're thinking and allows their investors, their board members, their stakeholders to know more. So we could spend a lot more time, the whole hour on those, but I'm gonna skip. So I think that's it on the slides for now. Thank you. So let me ask Butch to come on. Um, as I say, there is no one in the world in this area that's doing more than Butch and we appreciate that. So Butch, if you can give a, 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 a little bit of update on the principles for sustainable insurance initiative, the net zero initiatives and other things you've been doing to move this industry forward with deep thanks and appreciation, Butch. Thanks, Stephen. I think we need to start with the big picture. So the Paris Agreement was forged in 2015. And 20, in 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came up with a report on global warming at 1.5 degrees um, since pre-industrial levels. And what science has showed us is that a half degree of warming is a world of a difference. And that would apply to sea level rise, extreme heat, crop yields. Everything is more damaging and devastating based on every half degree of warming. So that's the reason why Commissioner Kreider was referring to net zero, because in order to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, we need to bring down emissions to net zero emissions by mid-century, if not earlier. So one can say that the best form, the ultimate form of risk management on climate change is to reach the target of the Paris Agreement to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. And that also presents one of the biggest opportunities for the insurance industries as we transition from a high carbon to a net zero emissions economy, what would be the opportunities for the insurance industry to ensure future risk pools, be it at low or zero emission uh, transportation or forms of energy that ultimately need to be insured as well. So I think that's the big picture. And disclosure is not new. The Carbon Disclosure Project, the Global Reporting Initiative, they've been around for about two decades. And even the, what is happening in the U.S. within California, Washington State, and those other states, 
that predates TCFD by easily eight to nine years. So there has been already uh, US leadership on this. What the TCFD comes with is that it attempts to put together what voluntary disclosure frameworks there with the mandate of the Financial Stability Board and enhance them in a way that they can be more um, decision useful for markets, financial markets around the world. Because the basic idea is that in order to really capture climate change risks and opportunities, these, has to, these have to be measured and actually by companies in the real economy and financial institutions and disclosed so that financial markets can price them in. Um, so what the TCFD recommendations have done um, is to help with uh, a more coherence and standardization. And so what we did in the Principles for Stable Insurance last year was to address what are those elements of TCFD which are very novel that where the industry needs a little bit more guidance. So last year we did a full year exercise on one topic of TCFD, which is one of the hardest nuts to crack, which is uh, scenario analysis. And this means using different climate change scenarios, 1.5, uh, well below two degrees, two degrees and a business as usual scenario and see how that would impact insurance portfolios across the physical dimension of climate change in terms of um, extreme heat, the flood, et cetera. Also the transition risk of climate change, what will happen to insurance portfolios in terms of opportunities in premium and revenue when we move from high carbon assets to low emission and zero emission assets. And then also looking at litigation, what happens when uh, potentially there's more litigation in the real economy, what will happen to insurance portfolios. And for me, the, in a nutshell, what we've seen here is that we have seen, we gathered 22 insurance companies and reinsurance companies around the world. My simple assessment is that the insurance industry by far and large are best, more best uh, well-versed on physical risk climate-related physical risk. And this is not a surprise because the whole issue of cat risk modeling started when Hurricane Andrew hit Miami in 1992 and led to the um, advent of catastrophe risk modeling, which insurers have been using for many years. However, even on physical risk impacts of climate change, we believe insurers are still starting the journey because climate change scenarios are coming right now. We have a net zero scenario, we have a two degree scenario. We have different climate change scenarios there from different sources, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the International Energy Agency. And these are quite new things to integrate. However, because of the history and physical risks in, in the insurance industry, we believe that that's a really solid platform to move forward to. What we believe the insurance industry even has more work to, um, to focus on is transition risks, because this has largely been at a focus by insurers as investors on what will happen to assets um, and potentially get stranded when we move from a high carbon to a net zero emissions economy. But the implications of that transition on insurance portfolios has not yet been well thought through. And we saw this in the exercise last year. Uh, we think that insurance companies in general have to think through how different regulatory market and technological changes, what would that mean in the context of underwriting portfolios? And so in, in the work that we did, we look at insurance for real estate and also insurance for energy. And we believe the work there can also inform transition risk assessment by insurers. And the last bucket that we looked at was litigation. And so most insurance companies there would simply monitor legal cases. And we have come up with a framework that a little, a little bit more sophisticated that looks at what will happen, what's the likelihood of litigation being brought, what's the chance that the case will rule in favor of the plaintiff, and what's the cost of remedy being sought. So if you are an insurance company and there's potentially litigation that will affect companies in the real economy, and if you're writing directors and officers liability and professional indemnity, what, do, what could that potentially mean uh, for you as a uh, liability insurance underwriter. So this is really still very embryonic stage in terms of assessment there. But the report is there on ensuring the climate transition. There's always a public good in what the UN does. So 
uh, while we work a lot with 22 companies, there's um, frameworks there that we've developed that any company can use. Finally, for me on net zero, um, we are also working on climate change mitigation. And so we have a sister initiative called the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, where insurers and pension funds and other investors have committed to transition their investment portfolios to net zero emissions. And they set science-based targets every five years. And we've just launched a net zero insurance alliance so how insurance companies can also transition their insurance portfolios to net zero uh, by 2050, if not earlier, in order to get to uh, goals of the Paris Agreement. And I mentioned that, Stephen, because the latest TCFD consultation looks at portfolio alignment. And that means aligning financial portfolios with the goals of the Paris Agreement. So they're looking at metrics, they're looking at targets, they're looking at net zero transition pathways. And this is, again, a new space that has to be uh, navigated. Thank you. Again, for our audience, you can see when I say there's so much richness in Butch's knowledge he's involved with so many different things thank you and we'll we'll come back to you in just a minute and before we go to jennifer as the next uh, there was a question in the box already about just the tcfd filing so just to be sure in the u.s since 2009 the insurers that were then operating in the six states that were mentioned if they had a hundred million dollars of premium or more they had to fill out a climate risk survey starting two years ago the insurance commissioners suggested why don't you replace that with TCFD? Two years ago, correct me if I'm wrong, Jennifer, I think, I think AIG was the first one two years ago. And then this year, eight companies have followed them. And our hope is that, that, that in the 221 filing, which is due shortly and beyond, lots of other, literally dozens or hundreds of companies do that. So that just context. So now again, let me go back to Jennifer Walton Grant, introducer from AIG for a great leadership and talk about your TCFD work in particular, Jennifer. Thank you, Stephen. It's great to be a part of the panel. So, you know, over the last several years, like many companies, AIG has significantly increased its engagement regarding sustainability issues. So we stood up an office of sustainability, my role was created, and we developed a sustainability strategy and some new commitments, particularly in the climate change arena. This year, we've committed to undertaking a carbon exposure assessment across both our underwriting and investment portfolios to really help us understand our baseline that can inform our future climate ambitions and strategy. And we're also committed to achieving net zero emissions operationally by 2050. Hopefully actually much sooner, we're developing a roadmap right now to see how we can really do that much more quickly. So you know, it's something we think about every day at AIG, probably like all insurers. And you know, we look at employing our expertise across you know, our underwriting risk management and investments, and also focusing on our own operations and the communities in which we operate to, really help to address the impacts of climate change on all of our stakeholders. And so, you know, given all this activity, it really makes sense that we would enhance our climate disclosures as well. So just to give a little background around, you know, how our climate uh, reporting has evolved, uh, we have published a TCFD report for the past three years, really in an effort to provide greater transparency and also align our reporting activities with industry standards. And so our 2018 and 2019 uh, TCF reports were standalone reports. And then for 2020, we really wanted to expand our uh, reporting beyond just climate. And so we launched our inaugural ESG report just last month. It's aligned to TCFD as well as SASB and GRI. And we've also uh, responded publicly to the CDP climate change questionnaire for the last 12 years. Um, definitely breathing a sigh of relief to get that uh, response in by the uh, yesterday's deadline. And in addition, we have been responding, as you've been hearing about the NAC Climate Risk Disclosure Survey. So prior to our TCFD report, we, we relied largely on our CDP responses to help um, respond to that report. But now we do submit our TCFD report in lieu of that survey, as you've heard um, from Stephen. And you know, a big thanks to the NAAC for allowing this option because I think it helps us to streamline our processes and also helps to avoid a lot of the survey fatigue that I know many of us feel. As for getting started, there are a few things that are very helpful to us on our journey. Uh, the first was that we established a cross-functional working group composed of key functions and business areas across the company that needed to provide content for our report. And they helped us to develop an implementation plan that first year. 
It's also, I think, important to understand that this is a real commitment of time and resources. For our first report, from the time we kicked it off to publication date, it took about five months. Uh, we, during that time, we interviewed more than 30 internal subject matter experts, and we also had a pretty rigorous review process. We involved our legal and finance teams, internal audit, our, our AIG disclosure committee, um, a uh, outside counsel, and also an external auditor. So, you know, a lot of people had to weigh in and look at their report. But I think the good news is, you know, most of us are not starting from scratch, even for your first report. Chances are you already have um, quite a bit of climate content in your existing materials, whether it's through your annual report or 10K or proxy statement, your ORSA report, news releases, you know, publications um, that hopefully you can draw on to get started. And we, we actually learned a lot by looking at other companies as well and their reports to see, you know, what are the possibilities of what, how and what we can disclose. Uh, why we use the TCFD recommendations, though, is that we want to be, you know, more responsive and transparent to our stakeholders, particularly our regulators and also uh, our investors who very much want to, to see uh, our views around climate risk and opportunities. And as you already heard, TCFD, you know, has really become the gold standard for reporting. We feel like, you know, our reporting through TCFD allows us to send a signal that reflects our company's increased awareness and attention to climate risk and opportunities. And then internally, I, I feel like the, the framework has really allowed us to have more dialogue and conversation about what AIG's views and positions are. And for that first report, as we started to have these conversations, you know, as a large global company, um, not surprisingly, you know, not everyone was necessarily in agreement. And so this allowed us to have, you know, real dialogue on coming to consensus around what our views and positions were and you know, what we wanted to say about those at the group level. Um, I think last but certainly not least, we want to make sure we get credit. You know, all of you who represent companies are doing good work in this space, but if we don't package it and put it out there in a way that's useful for our stakeholders, then we risk not only the opportunity to get credit, but also in having control over our narrative. So for many reasons, it made sense for us to align our reporting to TCFD. Uh, that is great. And, and, and what you, you've just given lots of great information. Clearly you um, are a leader in this area. AIG is lucky that you're doing all of these things. We're, we're fortunate that having all these, so we appreciate it. Let me, um, there's a lot more questions for you, but let me go to Ben to have uh, Ben both introduce himself and talk about the work that Zurich, Ben Harper from Zurich, North America, talk about your work. Ben, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. I really appreciate it and appreciate, appreciate being part of the panel today. Um, you know, being a responsible, sustainable company, it, it's kind of been a foundation of our business for quite some time. And you know, we've long recognized the risk associated with climate change and, uh, it's, it's why we're leading by example, by engaging with our stakeholders across the globe, reducing our own carbon footprint and leveraging our investment and in, in underwriting expertise, expertise to help our customers and society as a whole address the challenges that climate change presents. Um, and, and we're fortunate, I, I mean, our, our leadership thankfully has been recognized. I, I'm gonna brag here for a second, but uh, you know, being, Getting the number one ranking in the DJSI this past year was was very powerful for us, and, and you know the DJS ratings evaluates the sustainability performance of thousands of companies. Um, so, really, as part of our efforts, our we've, we've got so much good stuff to talk about. We we signed the UN Global Compact in 2011. We committed to the principles for sustainable investments uh, in 2012. Uh, we were the first insurer to make the business ambition for a 1.5 degree pledge. Um, and, and again, we're, we're, uh, um, we just recently were a founding member of the UN's Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, which Butch mentioned, um, the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment, and, and just an assortment of other multi-stakeholder platforms that are pursuing action on climate change. Uh, and, and then we have a lot of stuff internally we try to do too. Um, we founded and funded through our own foundation, the Zurich Flood Resilience Alliance, um, which is a consortium of global NGOs, uh, academics, some internal risk experts and external, we're, we're, we're helping hundreds of rural communities understand and, addre and address the, glow the growing threats of climate change, um, really with an emphasis on, on flooding. So, uh, you know, operationally, you know, 
we've constantly achieved some of our ambitious emission targets. Uh, we became neutral in 2014. We've committed to using 100% renewable energy across our global operations by next year. Um, and that looks like it's gonna be accelerated. Uh, we signed on to the EV100 pledge, uh, committing to switch our entire global fleet to electric vehicles before 2030. So, uh, you know, we've done a lot in this space um, and we recognize the importance of it. And we recognize, and we have recognized for quite some time, um, the risks and opportunities that this transition to a low carbon society presents. Um, with regards to TCFD, uh, we've been reporting TCFD, I think first year is 2017. Um, and we continue to refine our submission. Uh, and as Jennifer says, we, we find this has become a gold standard. It's, it's a must have for our industry. Um, and, and we have become survey weary and, and, and Jennifer, I think I'm gonna borrow survey fatigue. I, I, that sounds uh, a little nicer, um, but we do appreciate the fact that TS, TCFD has a recognition it has, uh, and it's really become a, a cornerstone of our sustainability program. So, you know, simply put, we recognize it as does others as the standards, and it does shape how we do business going forward. That's great. And again, congratulations for all the success that you and your colleagues and the great leadership that you've been, you've been talking about this. Um, Butch, let me go back to you for a minute. Um, what are your recommendations from all the companies you talk to um, as they think about if a company, if an insurance company had not done TCFD reporting yet and they're thinking about do it, what are the things that advice you could give them and who to talk to and processes to think about? It's very simple, um, Stephen. So TCFD has a disclosure component. Disclosure is a means to an end. So if you do not even have a climate change strategy and risk management framework, TCFD also serves that purpose. So if you are a, a company that's just starting, look at TCFD as a climate change risk and opportunity uh, framework that you can start with. And obviously there's a disclosure component to that. And so there's already the TCFD hub, there's work by the UN on the principles for stable insurance that you could refer to. There's all the disclosures, including the companies right now, AIG and, uh, and Zurich that they've done. There's a lot of reference already there that's being built. Secondly, I think the other thing that people should understand is that there is a direction for this to become mandatory globally. So the G7 meeting uh, recently announced that they will they back mandatory TCFD reporting. Um, and the International Financial Reporting Standard, the International Accounting Standards Board, they're all looking at sustainability reporting that's looking into the TCFD framework. So at some point down the line, uh, the gold standard could become the standard for many more jurisdictions around the world. So it will come eventually. Um, and then I think the third is there are, I think you also need to look at the benefits of, the, of using the TCFD. It's better risk assessment, climate risk assessment uh, for your company and its suppliers. Um, so it's also helped you inform your decisions on capital allocation. And it also informs your strategy uh, to better evaluate uh, risks and exposures over different time horizons. So for all of that, TCFD is beneficial and you're some, using something consistent uh, across jurisdictions. And then secondly, it is, it is in the direction of becoming mandatory increasingly uh, across jurisdictions. And so my simple advice is for folks who haven't done it to get on with it. This is really a learning by doing exercise. All the initiatives that Ben mentioned that Zurich is involved with, the principles for stable insurance, the principles for responsible investment, um, Jenny, Jennifer mentioned CDP. All of these were voluntary frameworks that these companies have adopted that they've already done. It's almost like a practice uh, uh, practice for them. It's learning by doing. No one is can have a perfect disclosure on day one that will tick all the boxes. I think the basic advice that we've seen is that those companies who have taken that journey took a decision a long time ago that this is going to be a learning by doing exercise. It will be more difficult and more challenging if they delay the whole exercise. So I think um, you can start with something. There's enough uh, evidence and materials there to look at as good practice 
Um, so the basic idea is move with what you have and learn with your peers and other stakeholders as you go along. Great, yeah, that's very, very helpful. At the end of this, we, we'll show a few of the links to the TCFD Knowledge Hub, hub that Butch just referred to. Um, I very much wanna get all of your thoughts for a second. So there's a poll question that um, if my colleague can put up. Um, now, we're assuming that most of you have joined because you're learning about this. So most have not done this yet, TCFD yet. But if, Anna, if you can put up the first question about whether folks have completed a TCFD report. And again, that we have people on the, on the call from company, insurance companies, we have regulators, we have activists, we have other folks on the call. Um, so some of you may not be, there's a, a not applicable uh, section two, but has your business completed a TCFD report? Yes, no, planning to or not applicable. Um, and uh, so if you could click on that, on whichever button and then click submit, and we're gonna give people, you know, 25 seconds or something. Um, so if you, you should see that on your computer, we very, or your phone or whatever platform you're on, uh, we very much wanna get your thoughts and we'll give people another 10 seconds um, to submit that. Um, my assumption is most people haven't done it yet, just from who I think is on, but I might be wrong. So why don't, Anna, you um, show the results when you get a chance. So 9% have, 39 have not, 19 planning to, and 34 it's not applicable. Okay, that's fascinating, interesting. Um, if we have more time, we're gonna to go to other questions later on, but let me go back to Jennifer um, and, and then to Ben. You've already talked about this a little bit, but talk more about the advantages of doing a TCFD and, and what have you learned kind of year from year in completing it? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think as I mentioned before, it's really helped us to kind of build a more cohesive story for how we're talking about and thinking about climate related risk and opportunities. And it's become really our go-to resource for AIG on these issues. And, and we actually do use the content. It's not just a report that we put on up on a shelf or a virtual shelf uh, that collects desks. We actually do use the content for responses to media inquiries, RFPs, due diligence questionnaires, scorecards surveys and it helps us to streamline you know our climate survey responses and you know we've talked about this already we get so many of them so it, it does help to have approved views and content that we have just kind of at our disposal to use as needed um, i also think that the tcfd report has helped to guide our conversations internally with our board with our executive leadership and externally with our clients and it's, it really serves as a nice takeaway um, for someone who wants to you know, learn more and take a deeper dive into these issues. I also have found that the report has helped to promote dialogue with uh, a lot of our stakeholders, uh, particularly regulators and investors. It's, it's been refreshing to know that they actually do read the report and they provided feedback, which has been invaluable to us as we continue to try to, to build upon each year's disclosure. I also think the report helps us too because it's really a record of our our actions, our commitments, and our progress. And it holds us more accountable. I, you know, if something makes it into the report, then it's out there and you know, we're accountable to it. And it gives us a platform to build upon. And so we really do see it as an iterative process and one where we hope we can continue to make progress. Thank you. And Ben, same question for you. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to echo a lot of the comments you've just heard. And, and I think first and foremost, there's a reputational brand boost associated with TCFD reporting. Um, it has become the survey standard in many industries. And it's becoming more commonplace. You know, weekly I'm filling out what, what we're now calling sustainability scorecards for companies. And on every single one of them, one of the, the, one of the questions will be, do you uh, do you do TCFD reporting? Um, but I think internally, it has also helped to structure our own internal mechanics. Uh, you know, we're in a highly regulated industry and we do a lot of external reporting. And where TCFD is, different, is differentiated is um, by providing insights into how we look under the hood with, our, with an internal lens. I think it has really shaped how we look at sustainability from a governance and a risk perspective. So it truly has shaped our entire sustainability strategy through consideration of these asks. 
Um, and so I want to just second some of Butch's comments from a few minutes ago. And, and Butch, you're 100% correct in your statement that TCFD provides an excellent framework for a holistic sustainability program. Uh, you know, we can we view it just just like Jen just said is much more than a survey. Uh, but here, you know, it's to to us, it's equally as valuable as a risk management tool itself. That's great. Butch, do you want to add anything on this before I go on to the next question? No, nope, just go. Um, no, okay. I think right. I think Jen and Ben were very eloquent. Great. So I'm going to reverse the order now. Uh, so so Ben and Jennifer and then Butch. Kind of the flip side is the first year you did it. What were some of the challenges and how have you worked to overcome them? You've built it into your system now. It's, it is the gold standard. I agree. But for again, for someone who's listening today and their insurance company, they haven't done it before. What uh, some of the challenges and how do you overcome them? Sure. Well, you, you know, I, I think the big challenge for us, first off, is data availability when we look at qualitative or quantitative things. Um, and it's just, you know, the nature of being in a big organization. But, but outside of some of that, I think the biggest challenge is that in some instances, our answers may seem incomplete. Uh, but that perceived completeness would include disclosure, proprietary information uh, of, of how we view and price risk, um, as well as other ways we conduct business which from a business standpoint, we simply cannot do. I mean, no two companies look at risk, both in the underwriting portfolio and in an investment portfolio, in the same way or through the same lens. So, so, so there's been a bit of a challenge sometimes to provide a meaningful response while trying to protect some of our intellectual property. Uh, and I think secondly, too, one of, one of the other challenges is around the transitional risks. Um, I, I think we're challenged in making qualitative assessments with transitional risk in particular. Um, the saying, we don't know what we don't know, rings so very true here. Uh, and, and I'll give you an, a, an example. Um, I was speaking to a risk manager at a state department of transportation, a state DOT, who explained to me the impact electric vehicles are having on road safety. Uh, and it's two things I would have never really related, um, but he explained to me that so much of the funding for their department of transportation comes from fuel tax. And with less consumption of fuel, they're getting less funding and with less funding they're having to stretch those dollars more um, and it's really starting to impact some of the maintenance budgets so they can't make certain that certain that uh, um, that water is getting off some of these roadways quick enough they haven't been able to take take care and maintain some of the right of ways they'd like to and because of that they're seeing an, an uptick in, uh, um, in in the number of accidents so I, I think we look at so many of these reports and we, we recognize that climate change um, is interconnected to so many other risks. Uh, and that's just an example of you know, what we see as a transitional risk that we would have never thought of. So you know, the good thing about it, we, we continue to be able to refine responses, our responses in TSCFD, and as we learn, we include those. But I'd have to say another challenge too is, is trying to make any kind of qualitative assessment on transitional risks when sometimes we just simply don't know what we don't know. Very helpful. Jennifer? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I would just echo a lot of what Ben shared. I mean, I, th I think um, maybe just kind of looking at it from a, you know, a first year reporting standpoint, um, just to you know, get off the ground, I think securing executive buy-in is imperative. I don't, I don't think we actually focused on that enough our first year. You know, there's a lot of competing priorities. So colleagues need to understand why this disclosure is so important and that it's supported at the highest levels of the company. Uh, we also spent a really good deal of time our first year just educating our colleagues around the, the, the importance of this disclosure. I think there's a sort of this natural tendency to be protective of information we haven't previously shared. Um, so, you know, when we published our second report, it meant we had a starting point we were able to leverage. Uh, you know, we had the prior year's learnings and, of course, you know, the context, the contacts that we made throughout the organization. That definitely helped with greater internal awareness, but also ultimately better cooperation. Um, and, and similar to Ben, you know, data is a, a huge challenge. You know, in some instances, we're just not ready as a company to disclose because we're still trying to understand our positions. But in a lot of cases, you know, the infrastructure is just not in place yet. Uh, for us to report out on some of, you know, the data that we would like to. And so what we are doing is, you know, noting these instances throughout the reporting process, kind of compiling them in a document and then looking at them for consideration for the following year's disclosure. And that's why I think, you know, doing a debrief after your 
of a report is really important um, to see, you know, maybe what was edited out or what didn't make it and what can be considered for the next year. Uh, and building on that, you know, maybe it, we also do a, a gap analysis as well. Um, and this really helps us to, you know, look, look at the recommendations, see where we're not able to disclose. And that guides our strategy conversations internally, kind of to Ben's point, you know, it's more, much more than a survey. This is really an opportunity for us to take, you know, what we put in the report and what we didn't um, and think about, you know, how do we continue to build upon that from a strategy standpoint? Um, so, you know, this, can, this exercise is often a lot like herding cats. Um, so as you're doing this for the first time, you know, the more simplified you can make the process, the better. Um, sharing the reporting guidance, maybe being able to put information in front of your subject matter experts, having them respond to something is helpful. Being able to share other companies' disclosures, I think also goes a long way in helping to educate your colleagues um, who need to, you know, help you with the report. I, and I guess just maybe a couple of closing thoughts are, you know, our experience is that, um, that demonstrating continuous improvement earns positive feedback from external stakeholders. And, and we recognize that there's always going to be opportunity, you know, to improve. And I think Butch really kind of underscored that. And honestly, for me, I think one of the most important messages to take away for anyone starting this journey is to focus on progress and not perfection. Absolutely. That's, that's such a watchword. And Jennifer and Ben, you've given so many great advice. Butch, do you want to add anything on what they've what they've been saying based on your vast experience? Yes, I think you know. Assuming you get what Jennifer is saying, which is buy-in from executive management, I think it's simply translating what DCFD means to your business. And if you look at it, there's four pillars to it: governance, strategy, risk management, metrics, and targets. How are these? pillars of TCFD relevant in terms of your assessment of risks and opportunities for your business. And one would see easily uh, at some point how this relates uh, to your business. Of course, there are different insurance companies there and it will be different across uh, insurance portfolios and investment portfolios. But I think making, translating what TCFD is into your business is really the key point. And um, I think the other thing that, in terms of a challenge, I think the fact that it's uh, TCFD pushes the thinking to look at climate change scenarios, where you have climate change science evolving and different scenarios coming from different providers, that takes time to understand. And, and, and so it can be overwhelming uh, for one who hasn't done it. And this is where um, collective or collaborative initiatives come into the picture on understanding and benchmarking yourself with your peers on what they're doing through collective initiatives. But even then, um, as, as you will refer to later on, there's um, lots of reference materials there that people can use to as a guide towards the different components uh, of TCFD. So I think uh, really it's, it, it's nothing that matters comes easy, right? But at some point, one has to make that decision to say that this is relevant. Um, this is how is this relevant to my company? How is this financially material? And how can I actually use it as a way to engage uh, my clients and my stakeholders? It's it's not simply investors or regulators. It's your own insured clients and potential clients in in um, in helping them transition to a net zero emissions economy. And this is a framework that can actually guide you to do that and un unlock opportunities as well. Great, thank you, Butch, and that's very helpful. We, we wanna get all of your perspectives on one more thing. We only have a few more minutes left. We're gonna ask another poll. So if my colleague can show the poll um, and we wanna get a sense of the benefits of TCFD reporting. Just as a, so again, the question is, what are the benefits of TCFD reporting? It is multiple choice. So it's aligned with the NAIC climate disclosure survey, increasingly used by regulators, helpful planning tool and other. So please complete this as you know, from your thoughts and, and what you'd recommend. While we're doing this, again, we're not gonna get to all the questions that are great during this. So as long as we have your email, we will make sure to follow up um, with, with, with each of you. We're also gonna send this deck to everybody as well. I also wanna mention just while people are completing the survey that uh, um, one, one of the colleagues, uh, Jay Burns from Washington identified in the, in the Q and A that Hartford 
has done TCFD reports, I think it's every other year. So we appreciate that as well. Um, so let me see if, uh, the, if we can give people uh, another few seconds. And uh, Anna, if you can show the results of what people think for the survey. 63% uh, line with NAIC, 66% used by regulators, helpful planning tool and other. Great. Um, well, that, that's very, very helpful. So let me see, we have just a few, another minute because I want to show some of these slides. Um, uh, uh, which part of TC, I'm just reading one of the questions here um, uh, so, uh, for Zurich and AIG. Thank you for your client leadership. To what extent and how have your underwriting practices evolved to support your emission reduction strategies as you think about these areas? So Jennifer and Ben, ask you to be brief. Sure, I guess I'll jump in here. Um, it's, it's had a big impact on, on, on how we underwrite as a business. Um, and we've always, I've always said that uh, integrating sustainability into our underwriting, you know, success is going to come when an underwriter, underwriter is considering sustainability without even knowing it. So, um, you know, we've aligned a lot of our underwriting uh, risk tools with some of these, uh, with some of the data providers that give us information about carbon footprints of some of the potential insurers. And we've also had to make some hard decisions. I think this will answer another question that popped up as well um, around certain industries that, that are of particular concern with us. And we put some very specific thresholds around under which we will, un we will underwrite coal and, um, and oil sands business, as well as uh, any dedicated infrastructure for either, either of those. So it's had a it's had a big impact on us, and 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 clearly, uh, moving forward, it's it's only going to grow. Um, and uh, but there's been some some other successes as well, such as um, you know the adoption of science-based targets within our underwriting, and the consideration that we give to those, and and just how important we see SBTs playing a role in um, our underwriting strategy going forward. Jennifer, briefly, yeah, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I just quickly, you know, I mean, I agree with what Ben says. I mean, we're having these conversations about how to integrate ESG more into our underwriting process, particularly looking at the energy transition. We have an energy transition project underway, kind of focused on our global specialty energy and construction uh, clients, um, you, you know, looking at how we can be a partner with them through the transition. And, you know, that starts with the underwriting process, but also there's a lot of opportunity for innovation of products and services and, you know, how we can think about building out a renewables book of business. And so I just think, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, we are noticing our underwriters incorporating climate and ESG into their processes. And I think there's more um, dialogue now around, you know, how do we start to formalize that thinking a bit more? That's great. So can I ask my colleague to put, there are two final slides. We're not going to spend time on them in detail, but just to show you when you get them in, in, the, in the email with additional links. So that Butch talked about these earlier. Again, they, they're part of the TCFD Knowledge Hub, um, the information there. And then the, ne the next slide, please, um, shows, again, examples that, that have been collected. So there is a lot of great information. We have leaders, obviously, Ben and Jennifer and their companies commissioners like the, like, like the two from Washington and California who are here to kick this off and, they, and their colleagues, many who are on this call, uh, Butch and his colleagues. So everyone's here to be helpful. Um, we've just literally scratched the surface. We will follow up with a question we didn't get to, but to thank you. Thank you for what each of you are doing as companies, as advocates, as regulators, what you're doing. Um, we're all facing greater risks, both on transition and physical risks and your work is very important. So with that, thank our, dedicate, our, our amazing speakers and hope everyone has a great day. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye now. Thank you.